You're listening to episode 780 of the Father Bills Podcast. Welcome back. This week's episode, I want to let you know, has a little error in it, and that is I mentioned Father, Father Ron Rollheiser as a Franciscan, but he's actually an OMI priest, so a missionary oblate of Mary Immaculate. So just be aware of that. And in the meantime, this is the homily entitled Giving Twice, offered on the second Sunday in Lent, 2021. In my preparation for today's homily, I came across an idea that I was struggling with from a priest, Father Ron Rollheiser. He's a Franciscan and a, a spiritual guide for many people, and I've listened to a lot of his tapes, and he's got wonderful books. Before, though, I offer his idea, it is important that we understand that a gift, by definition, is something that is not deserved, but given freely. I mean, think about it. If you give a gift and you have strings to it, what kind of gift is that, right? I'm going to give you this, but you better treat it right. I'm going to take it back. See, it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, we just kind of know that. I think we can all agree on that. Furthermore, a sacrificial gift is the greatest kind of gift to give and to receive. And are they not also the hardest ones to give and to receive? We just know this. So it's interesting, according to Father Ron Rollheiser, that in order to receive a truly valuable gift, it must be received twice. And I was scratching my head, huh? What does it mean? I had to think about this. And, like, and this is his reflection today, uh, a spiritual reflection on this whole issue with Abraham and Isaac. So in order to receive a valuable gift, it must be received twice. So here's an example. I had to drum up examples. Imagine someone like myself gives you a bag of gold. Wow, right? It's heavy. You might say, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I, I can't receive this. I'm not worried of this. I mean, are you kidding? That's, that's too much. I don't deserve this. And we instinctually reject it. Then the giver responds back. No, no, no. I understand how you feel, but I want to give it to you. I want you to have it. I insist. How many times have we been in that situation, one side or the other? What happens then is the giver finally responds, okay, or the, the, the receiver finally responds and receives that gift. So they've been given the gift twice. Once they rejected it, and the second time they, they receive it. And sometimes it takes longer than that, right? And in fact, the giver has told the person twice to receive it, and finally the receiver does. And that confirms now for the receiver that the giver really wanted to give it, as opposed to a half-baked, well, if I have to give it to you. Oh, you didn't want it? Oh, great, I'll take it back. Not a gift, right? Not freely given. In some cultures, this is just the norm. I was talking to Anthony, and in the Vietnamese culture, this is a common thing. Last night at the Spanish Mass, la misa espanol, esta situación es común, is part of the culture. For if someone said, I want you to have this, and you were to immediately say, great, thanks, and move on, you might be considered greedy. But in this case, knowing that it's been refused and given again and finally received, we know as the receiver that the gift is truly, truly ours, unmerited, undeserved, and the giver really wanted to give it. So this dynamic, I'd like to offer, adds some nuance to a very disturbing story that we heard from the, second, or the 22nd chapter of Genesis. This is a dramatic one. Thank you for proclaiming it, Gene, dramatically. Remember, 
Abraham and Sarah, if you didn't know this, were without a child from their own coming together as husband and wife. And they're in their like 90s by this point. I mean, God promised them that they would have children and they would be, there'd be many descendants, right? Many stars in the sky and sand on the seashore. If you were given this promise by God, wouldn't you start doubting after a while? Like, okay, we're 50, come on. No, now we're 60, really? Now we're 70, okay, I'm not sure that I heard correctly. Now we're 80, okay, I'm done. 90, I'm clicking off, I'm going to be dying soon, so uh, whatever, God. I'm obviously, obviously inserting this into their minds. I don't know what they're thinking. In fact, we know that Abraham was incredibly faithful, and this is part of the point of the story, how faithful Abraham would be. But again, Sarah and Abraham were waiting, and they get this child. I can only imagine, again, I'm putting something into their minds that I can't know, but I can imagine if it was me, I'd be like, wow, what an amazing gift. We have a child completely out of the ordinary, and it's, I feel so unworthy. All my doubt, possibly, but see, Abraham was faithful the whole time. But there is another story before this, and it's, it's, they did actually find another child before this. Do you know what the name of that child was before this? This is a little nerdy thing. Sarah was upset that she was not giving a child. She kind of put it on herself. This is long before, this is before Isaac. And so she, gave, she gives her maidservant, Hagar, to Abraham and he sires a child from her. Does anybody know who that was? The name? Ishmael. Ishmael. And Ishmael's a wild, scrappy kind of person. And eventually this gets the dynamics get such that Hagar and Ishmael get booted out because there's competition between Isaac, the chosen one, and the one that they hoped it would be the chosen one. So you could say that Abraham and Sarah struggled in their waiting, but now Isaac has arrived. But see, God wants to make it clear, I want you to have this. I want you to have Isaac, and I've been faithful to my promise. So now let's move on to this very disturbing moment where Isaac is about to be sacrificed. I mean, think about this, right? If someone told you that I was told by God to kill my child, we as a culture, reasonably so, would charge them with manslaughter or murder. And then they need to go see psychologists for mental health care. I don't want us to get caught up in that. That's... That's not the main point of the story, but it is something that to like, wow, that just shows how radical this thing happened that was. But here's the interesting thing. We hear that God wanted not a human sacrifice and do not touch him through this angel, right? This messenger, meaning angel. Do no such thing. Do not do the least of this, right? God loves Isaac. God loves Abraham and Sarah. But this act then demonstrates that Abraham is willing to do whatever God wants. And God makes it clear he does not want this. But here it is now. He gave them Isaac. Abraham's willing to give him away. And God gives, Abraham, gives Isaac back a second time. So if there's any lingering doubt that Isaac is the one where this you know, descendants, as many as stars in the sky and sand on the seashore, is the one compared to, say, Ishmael. It is clear now because that dynamic has happened. Now, I want us to also now ponder on this. Like, wouldn't it have been a nice that they just, that God didn't have to do that? Well, I can't get into God's mind. But how about us human beings? Wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to do this interplay? Someone asks first, you know, someone gives a gift, we have to say no, and then they have to give it again. Wouldn't it be nice if we just had the, we could be honest about things right off the bat and mean what we say, but that cultures are different. All of this, this event that we hear in the 22nd chapter of Genesis, 
is a foreshadowing of Christ's sacrifice. God gave us in the beginning our lives and a communion with him, a covenant from the beginning, a faith-filled covenant from the beginning. And yet we, humanity, starting with Adam and Eve, broke it. Remember how it was. The story in Genesis, they, Adam and Eve were in harmony with each other. They were husband and wife. They were in harmony with God. And they were in harmony with the environment, even. Everything was in harmony as the story goes. But their disobedience now breaks that. God is not intimidated by this. He's not going to be stopped by this. He is the perfect lover. Who, no matter how faithless or harlotous humanity could be, we see the story repeated in Hosea, God is going to be faithful. And so he offers covenant after covenant, renewing the ones previous. And he does it still. But it comes to a a crescendo, the final word of covenant, when he brings his son to us, Jesus. You notice now Jesus, we know, of course, the story. Jesus is going to be sacrificed. But instead of humanity, although humanity does kill Jesus through the Romans, right? Jesus is like Isaac. Willing. It's not like Isaac, if you read the story, it's not like Isaac like, well, okay, where's this, where's the, the sacrifice going to be? Do you think that all of a sudden by being tied up and put on maybe a stake or however the sacrifice was going to be done, that Isaac's ignorant that he is the one? So Isaac foreshadows Christ himself. The plan that God is going to offer soon, well, soon in biblical time. And Jesus then allows himself to be sacrificed himself. This time, instead of saying, no, 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 we want a lamb, it's not Isaac, he's going to allow himself to be sacrificed. God gave us a covenant, and Jesus, through his action, once again gives us a covenant, a second time. Yes, there's many covenants, but again, in the framework of this big idea that God has given covenants, make it all one, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, new covenant we hear about is definitive. And it's going to be offered to us over and over and over again. Thank God, because how many times since Christ has humanity sinned? I mean, even the apostles, right? Peter denies him three times. Judas betrays him. The rest of the guys scatter, except for John. And we have Mary, Mary Clopas, and John at the crucifixion site. Very few who are supposedly faithful we're there at the most difficult time. So in offering a sacrifice, God says, I'm coming back to you. It is so important that you know that I love you, that I'm going to show you the highest form of love. It is the definitive mark. Because it's not like God's going to have somebody else sacrifice. He himself is going to do it. So he's like the example, the par excellence example of love. So no matter how many times we sin, and we sin, God is continually forgiving us. And he's given us an amazing sacrament to celebrate that through, right? And that's the sacrament of reconciliation, a.k.a. confession, so that when we come to Mass, we can once again also be reminded there's an altar, there's a sacrifice about to happen. It is the representation of the one sacrifice that we have all access to. That by receiving his body, blood, soul, and divinity, this lamb who was slain forgives us of sin. And we, as Catholics, qualify sin. Um, there is sin that's deadly. There's sin that's not deadly. St. Paul speaks about this. Or I think it's St. Peter. And those venial sins are forgiven. Sometimes in confession, I have to help explain with folks. Like they, It's fine to confess a sin that's venial. 
but that should not that that venial sin should not prevent you from receiving communion because people sometimes will refuse themselves communion when they have sin on their soul but it's disproportionate when would we then self refuse our self communion when would we self excommune ourselves is when we're in mortal sin and that can happen in all kinds of ways maybe i just had a drag down fight with my spouse and here we are it was you know might have been in the car on the way here maybe we're not now prepared to receive communion i don't know again this is what we have to ask ourselves how deep is that break that i have just done and participated in and we're supposed to then be cleansed before we receive that but see when there's these smaller venial sins this is the means the the weekly means for each of us to receive that forgiveness that christ wanted to give us by receiving him who is the sacrifice so we then will have received the fruits that were abandoned from the beginning what was given in the beginning was eternal life and we know that the eucharist is eternal life breaking into time so on this altar what appears as bread and wine gets infused into the very being of Christ and notice at the at the liturgy when we it's like we were given here's this this whole ritual again we were given the fruits of creation and we made bread and wine out of them we ask god to come to us god does come to us on the altar in the host which now is transformed we lift them up to give them back and we put them back down because god wants us to have them he gives it to us twice again so let us not be confused let us not have doubt god's love for us is powerful and corporeal it's not a head trip though it can be i mean if you have a if you have an emotional experience from receiving communion awesome that's wonderful what a gift but don't expect it some people have asked would you know do you know wouldn't it, can you tell a consecrated host from a non-consecrated host like wouldn't that be great if it glowed <laughs> that would be nice but it doesn't it's like people that met mother teresa who's like you know 4 foot something barely change you know very short and is un remarkable from the people i know who have met her I mean it's one thing to hear her on television but to meet her in person is something different when they met her she's just unremarkable Jesus was like that he was hidden in flesh you could say very accessible to everybody but yet as he then starts to speak and do things God is made manifest So when we receive the Eucharist Christ is being given to us a second time. We lift up our prayers and Christ back to the Father. The Father, nope, here you go. This is for you. Take and eat all of you. This is my body. Take and drink. This is my blood. In conclusion, God's love is sacrificial. And he gives us this gift of love and salvation over and over. Now let us then pray that we would receive this gift more deeply. Let us pray that we will be able to accept his sacrificial gift of love in the Eucharist and in any other time after that when he wants to give you his love. Do not refuse it. This is the hope I have is that instead of waiting for him to give it a second time, just the next time he gives it, receive it. If you feel unworthy, you are unworthy that's the good news it's kind of scandalous we say uh, lord i am not worthy that you should enter under my roof but only there but only say the word and he has given the word we just heard the word and we're called to feast on that word do you remember the collect receive that word feast on it and be transfigured yourself transformed as augustine speaks about become who you receive and go out into the town into the the area into our families into our workplaces 
and be that person, be that sacrificial Christ to them. The world needs this deeply. The models of love that we are given are heavily flawed, disoriented, and we need it focused and purified. And, it, and it's a universal a reception when people see that we sacrifice for them, they immediately understand what it is. It's just built in our DNA, you could say. And we feel, they might feel unworthy. I've given this recommendation to spouses when there's an argument. I don't know if it works or not, but my recommendation is love your spouse ridiculously, selflessly, to the point where they feel completely unworthy of your, your love. It might change them. It's not a guarantee. But I just know for myself, when I've been given gifts and people sacrifice for me, I feel very unworthy. And it's not a bad thing. But I don't let that overcome me and start thinking uh, erroneous thoughts. And I am pond scum. And I should reject this. Like, no, no. This is God's loving us. When someone says something to you that's loving or does something that's incredibly selfless for you, it ultimately is for God. So receive it. Say thank you. And praise God. And if you keep it in that context, I'd like to offer, we'll be able to more receive his love. Because we can't, I can't fully, I mean, God's love is, well, God's love's created everything, right? And in the Old Testament, no one could see God and live because his, his power is so immense. We would just be obliterated. But through Jesus Christ, hidden in human form, you might say, and now through you and me, God is more accessible. Might you this week be that sacrificial loving person for someone who struggles? And maybe a transfiguration can happen in them, but hopefully with us first so we can go out and proclaim the gospel of the Lord. Thank you again for listening to this episode of the Father Bill's Podcast. If you go to my website, you can go there and ask questions uh, by just clicking on a link that allows you to send an email to me. You can also go to my Facebook page from there and my Twitter account, and I'll do my best to respond to you as soon as I can. And in the meantime, may God bless you, have a great week, and stay safe. Bye-bye.